Hello, and welcome to Introducing Me. I'm your host, Sarah. I started this podcast to get to know other people and lifestyles while discovering more about myself. Each episode, I'll give a new guest a chance to discuss their background, culture, interests, or whatever they want to talk about to help increase all of our own worldviews. Today, I would like to introduce you to Ezzy. He had a life-threatening illness in 2019, while at the same time connecting with his ancestral roots. That is the very short introduction I will be giving him today because I'm excited to have him share more about his life experiences and his various journeys. So thank you so much, Ezzy. Why don't you go ahead and tell our audience a little bit more about you? Well, thank you so much for inviting me, Sarah. I appreciate it. I'm really excited to be here with you today. Um, as you said, I, I told you to introduce me as Ezzy because I tell people Ezzy is easy. Uh, but my full name is Richard Kweku Eziagu Akiyemi. And I wasn't born with that name, but when I learned through, well, first I visited Nigeria and the people told me that I was Nigerian. And then when I did my DNA, I found out that they were absolutely correct. On my father's side, I am Nigerian Igbo and Yoruba. And on my mother's side, I am a Ghanaian Fanti of the Fanti people of Ghana. And so I changed my name to reflect the culture because of the legacy of enslavement in the U.S. and other places. Of course, I and many others, which actually total about 200 million when you look at North America, South America, the Caribbean, there are literally at least 200 million uh, descendants of formerly enslaved people that actually, though they've created a rich culture by its own right, they have this other side of them that they don't know. So once I learned, I wanted to have each component of the culture that I didn't know in in there in my name. So Kweku is actually means Wednesday born, Fanti. It's Fanti, of, and it's also Akan tribes like the Ashanti, Akuyapim, and there's one more that I can't remember. Uh, and then Ezeagu is Igbo, and it means king of lions. Akiyemi is Yoruba, and it means warrior king well suited to power. And the Yoruba say, you will live up to your name. Um, so that is what my name means. So when someone says my entire name, Richard Kweku Eziagu Akiyemi, what they've said is powerful ruler, because Richard in English means powerful ruler, born on Wednesday, king of lions, warrior king well suited to power. So it, it definitely is a mouthful. So after they say that, they can, they can, I tell people, you can rest now. You can rest. You've done your job. You can rest. <laughs> So why did you first visit Nigeria and how did you then find out about your roots? Yes, actually, I wasn't actually going to find out about my roots. I was going to Nigeria because my attending, not, not attending, but my primary care physician uh, is Nigerian. And he would tell me about it when he would go back and things. And I was showed interest. He started inviting me to the Independence Day celebration uh, October 1st is Nigeria's Independence Day. They've just celebrated their 63rd independence. And so I got introduced to West African food, Nigerian food. I don't know if you've tried it or any of your listeners have tried it, but if you haven't, you are missing, missing. And I will tell you, if you know some Nigerians, especially this month, ask them if there's a Independence Day celebration that they can invite you to because they are very outgoing and introducing their culture and inviting people. You see different people, you know, from all just walks there at the Independence Day celebration. And you get to taste things like egusi soup and pounded yam and moi moi. And these are different West African dishes. They're so delicious. But a lot of them have a lot, some heat. They, you know, they like a lot of pepper. So I think for those kind of events, they don't make it as hot as they normally make it at home. But, you know, be prepared for some pepper. And then the fashion of the Nigerian women, if you have not seen, their fashion is second to none. And I mean, it is really second to none. So the, what they do with these fancy galays, I don't even understand how they get it to, to stay that way. It's like it looks like a, a loose piece of fabric. And then the way they wrap it and, and get it to stay, I still don't know how they do that. But it's just gorgeous. Uh, so, you know, he had he started inviting me and then. Uh, after I'd been going there for several years, I, I told him I want to go to Nigeria with him one time when he goes. 
And he kind of gave me the side eye because he said, a lot of people ask me about going, but they don't really go. They just ask me about going, you know. And I said, no, no, I'm serious. I, I really had to convince him. He, you know, he, he, he said, because so many people that asked him and not gone, he really didn't know if I was really going to. I said, no, no, I'm really, really serious. And so he said, OK, well, in November, because uh, uh, this was 2012, he said November 2013, he said, my uh, niece, my, my wife's niece will be having a wedding and uh, you can meet the whole family. And actually, her mother is the first female rear admiral on the continent of Africa. Uh, and she is Nigerian, of course, first one in Nigeria, but on the entire continent of Africa. And uh, she has actually 26 names. We, we can talk about that later, a part of the Yoruba culture. So you got this first visit and you didn't know about, you know, your background and, and this culture that was part of you. Mm -hmm. So what were kind of those first conversations like not, you know, having known, you know, the background of your parents? Oh, that's a good, that's a good, well, I knew the background of my parents, but I didn't know the other, I, I, I my analogy for African-American people is we're like the full moon. You're the beautiful full moon, you know, it's so beautiful. It comes out once a month. Songs have been sung about it. But when you look at the full moon, there's another half that is just as big that you don't see. You know, we only see that full moon is only one half of the moon. So I tell the the story that so African-Americans are kind of like that full moon. We have this rich African-American culture, aspects of which have been copied all over the world. And you only copy what you admire. So I tell people, you know, if somebody tries to tell you you're inferior, I said, if somebody's copying off of you, you're not inferior. People only copy what they admire. OK, so you're exceptional. I said, you got to Don't listen to what they say. Watch what they do. But at any rate, uh, so when I look at the full moon and I compare it to African-Americans, we have a rich African-American culture. But at the same time, just like the full moon, there's another half of us that we are not aware of through no fault of our own because of the, the in, enslave, enslavement of Africans uh, back you know, in the days when that happened. So I, I, I tell people, um, this is like finding out and connecting to your roots is like lighting up that dark side of the moon. So you know, most Americans call themselves by the country. So if you talk to we might refer to European Americans as a group, but if you talk to them individually, they say, no, I'm a German American. I'm a, a Spanish American. I'm an Italian American, right? If you talk to Asian people, they don't say that uh, they're, I'm an Asian American. They say, I'm a Chinese American. I'm a Japanese American. I'm an Indonesian American. So African Americans are the only group that has had all of these different names, you know, Negro, colored, black, um, African-American and now BIPOC. I don't know if your listeners know that BIPOC. I just recently heard this one, black indigenous people of color and no other group has had so many descriptors. Um, Marcus Garvey once said that a people without the knowledge of their history, origin and culture are like a tree without roots. And so I've been been getting the word out and my goal is to help as many as want to to connect back because there is an absolute enrichment and life transformation that can happen when you connect back to that side and light up in, in the in my analogy light up that dark side of that moon and so well how i found out which was your question is when we when i first got there i was at the abeto hotel in abuja okay so nigeria has 36 states and a federal capital territory just like we have 50 states in the district of columbia the federal capital territory is kind of like District of Columbia because it's in, you know, kind of centrally located in the country. And it's just its own territory, kind of like the way they carved out Washington, D.C. Um, so we were in Abuja and the 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 Abeto Hotel and we were down at the bar just getting a malt. And I thought a malt because I'm from America, malt usually is malt beer, right? But it was a it was like a dark cream soda. The, the best way I can describe it is like a dark cream soda. It's very, very flavorful. It's, I mean, it's really good. Uh, and it's very popular in Africa, these malts. So my the doctor was drinking one and he said, well, why don't you try it? He said, it's pretty good. So I tried it. And the, the beverage manager came over. He looked at me. He said, 
are you Nigerian? I said, well, I don't know. You know, I'm African-American. Slavery thing happened. Got to do some DNA, find out. He said, you are an Igbo man. I tell you, you're an Igbo. I said, really? He said, yes. I said, well, how do you know? He said, you look, he said, if you did not open your mouth with your accent, I would think that you were born and raised in Nigeria. I said, are you serious? Yes. So a little later in the trip, there were some Yorubas and they said, are you Nigerian? Just like, and so I told them the same thing. And then they said, I believe you are a Yoruba because you have Yoruba features. And so I said, well, this other guy told me I was, was Igbo. They said, oh, no, 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 no. You are definitely Yoruba. So, you know, the Igbos didn't recognize the Yoruba side. The Yorubas didn't recognize the Igbo side. But at any rate, uh, when I came home and did my DNA, I found out that they were correct. So even though the purpose of my trip was just to, you know, learn more about my doctor's culture, I found out that it was my culture as well. And I was so excited because I had no idea in all of these things that I had been so excited about, like the the food and the culture and the fashion. This like this is African attire I'm wearing right now, uh, which is much more comfortable. I don't know if, if any of your listeners have tried uh, West African attire, but it is much more cool, comfortable. You notice it doesn't have the traditional collar that that the Western shirts have. And so at first I had to get a little used to that because, of course, I was just used to Western attire. But then, you know, I've kind of gotten used to it. And I actually like the African attire better because it's just, you know, it's really cool. The colors and this is embroidery. You know, I don't know how well you can see it on uh, or how well the, the, the listeners will be able to see it or the viewers. But, um, you know, usually they have nice embroidery on there. So it's really, really very classic. And uh, so yeah, that's that's really how I started um, connecting. And once I found out, I legally changed my name. And interestingly enough, Bill O'Reilly from, you remember O'Reilly from the, the No Spin Zone on Fox? No. But, wow. But, well, you're too young for that? Oh, my goodness. I'm also well, not me. someone who watches like a lot of things. Okay. So there are people my well, age who could know what you're talking about, and I'm just not okay. one of them. <laughs> well, some of the people listening may know, but he actually did. And so when I became Nigerian, of course, I was doing research, and then I started doing speaking engagements and keynote speaking. And so some of the Nigerian artists I was in front of, I had to do some research. And what I learned really blew away some of the stereotypes and myths that the U.S. media tries to perpetuate. For example, one big myth in America is that the most educated group by percentage of people that have degrees are Asian Americans. And that is false because it's actually the Africans led by the Nigerians. Nigerians get bachelor's degrees at a rate of more than two to one compared to native born Caucasian Americans. And they get advanced degrees at a rate of more than three to one. And they are by earning the most successful group that's ever set foot on U.S. soil. And this was like, it blew me away. Even Bill O'Reilly did a show and he talked about these very things that I'm telling you about right now. So some of your listeners who may be old enough and know the no spin zone because it ran for several years. You know, he was like Bill O'Reilly, the no spin zone. Uh, he did an episode where he talked about these very same things. And I said, it's interesting. And it, it just, to me, I think that the, the re is, I think the reason why the stereotype is there is because when you have this idea that I've heard from some people that they did my ancestors a favor, or like you've just recently heard in Florida, where uh, people that were enslaved, you know, that was a benefit to them because they learned to trade. I mean, they just recently said that in Florida. Uh, when you have people that have that kind of idea that they did my ancestors a favor by enslaving them, uh, and, and then you hear that uh, the people that have the same DNA, look how they have achieved in, in, in a nurturing environment. So you have one group with the same DNA in an environment that's not nurturing, except for your own community, of course. But then you have another group that's in an environment uh, that's very nurturing. And when I say very nurturing, let me explain what I mean, okay? The Yoruba naming ceremony is a great example of African culture. When a baby is born in the Yoruba community, the, commu the, 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 the local area of the village, they come together to celebrate that baby, 
and to have a naming ceremony. So the different people will either give money or if, they, or if they're farmers, they'll give something from the farm, some kind of economic benefit to the family. And they will suggest a name for that child, okay? So let's say the parents end up naming the child, let's say it's a girl, the parents end up naming the girl uh, 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 Sola, Shola, S-H, they use S-H, so Shola. So they named the girl Shola, right? But some families might have named her Sessi, or they might have named her Itunu, or they might have named her Wami. So as they're walking with little Shola down the street, another family will come up and say, Wami, you look so beautiful today. How are you doing? Another family will come up and say, Itunu, oh my, you are a vision. Oh my goodness, right? And another family might come up and say, you know, and, and, and say, call her another name. And so after a while, when she gets old enough, she's going to say, Mommy, my name is Shola. Why do these people keep calling me other names? Right. And so then she'll find out, oh, my child, when you were born, the people that are calling you these names were at your naming ceremony when you were just a baby. They each named you that name on that day. And to them, to that family, that is who you are. Each family calls the child by the name that they named that child on that day. It's kind of like they each have ownership, that part of ownership of the child. So the children grows up in an area where they are believe, you know, they, they, they are nurtured and loved. And the rear admiral that I told you about, she has 26 names and she knows all of her names. And I said, wow, I said that, that is powerfully rich culture. And, and, I, and I saw why the Nigerians have this work ethic and are so successful. But then I compare what I know from my research to the stereotype, because the stereotype we see is Nigerians are all scammers. Every Nigerian's a scammer. I mean, that's, that's kind of what you see, you know? And I said, now, isn't it interesting when this is the fact, but then this is the stereotype. So um, it's it, it, what part of what I'm doing when I'm telling people about the book that I've written and how I connected back. And I want to help those who want to connect. But also it's a, a, an education piece to kind of debunk a lot of the myths and stereotypes that are absolutely lies. As a matter of fact, the poem that God gave me when I was on on the sands of Badagri, Badagri is the point of no return where my, the last place my ancestor stood before being taken off the continent of Africa, um, the, the last two lines of that poem that God gave me when I was there, and I had a visceral, visceral experience, the last two lines were, reject the lies of yesterday. Embrace the greatness in your DNA. That's some very powerful things you've shared right here. And as you've said, just like the vast differences in culture that people may not realize. I will also note, because I forgot to mention it earlier, I don't actually record this video, so people will not be able to see you, though I can see you. Um, okay. <laughs> so once you started to learn about your culture, what sort of things beyond changing your name started to change in your life in terms of like, where you live, how you, you know, you've started wearing different clothes, what sort of experiences changed and how did that come about? Well, yes, I, you know, I started uh, getting uh, Nigerian attire. Uh, I had not yet fully connected to the Ghanaian side because I really had a, a long-term relationship with my doctor and then he introduced me to, so I know knew many, many more Nigerians. I only knew like one or two Ghanaians, uh, but as I would sometimes wear, like, you know, I go to shop with my sister at Costco, and sometimes I wear my Nigerian attire, of course, because it's so comfortable. And the thing that really shocked me is how many people would just stop me and compliment. They said, I really love what you're wearing. That's really nice. And then, you know, a lot of African-Americans would say, where did you get that? I, I want to get that. That I, I really like that. I mean, it was overwhelming, the number of people, because, you know, for every person that stops and says that, there's others that, that might look and say, oh, that really looks nice. But, of course, they'll never, they'll never say anything because they might be shy or whatever. But I was just really blown away by that. Uh, and then I even went on YouTube. YouTube is great. I learned how to make a goosey soup 
on YouTube. So I found a video uh, where this person is teaching you how to do it. So I would get all the ingredients. Then I would I would go a little while. I would stop, you know, because I okay okay let me do that and then play. Then I stop. Let me do that. Play. And so I actually made a goosey soup pounded yam because you can actually get it powdered just like powdered mashed potatoes. You can get the powder for the pounded yam. And uh, have you ever seen an African yam? Do you know what I'm talking about when I say African yam? No. Okay, so for the listeners out there, but now that you've let me know that I have to be very descriptive because they're not going to see the video that we're looking at, um, just imagine a russet potato. You know, russet are the biggest potatoes we have in America, right? Mm -hmm. Imagine a russet potato on steroids, like about four or five of those potatoes put together and make them about maybe 25 to 30 percent bigger. That's what a... A yam looks like a small tree trunk, a, a part of a small tree trunk. I mean, it's the biggest root vegetable I have ever seen. It's like, just imagine your forearm. It can be as long as your forearm and, and bigger around, okay? Um, and it's one of the staple foods of uh, certainly West Africa. I'm not sure because I've only been to, I've only been to Ghana and Nigeria in Africa. So I know it's a staple food there. It's probably staple other places, but I don't want to say because I haven't been there. I haven't experienced it yet. But um, what they do, they do so many things. They boil it. They fry it. Just like what we do to potatoes, they do it. But what they do, when, when you know how we do mashed potatoes, but imagine very stiff mashed potatoes. And so what they do, like in America, you might have things like cornbread that you eat with things. Well, they don't really do cornbread. What they do is they have the stiff pounded yam. And then they'll serve it with the soup. And so they'll take a little bit in their hands and they'll eat it with the soup. And you you eat with your hands. You, you wash your hands really well. And you eat with your hands. And so I started doing that. So it's just, I don't know. It's, it's hard to put into words how enriching it is to connect with your culture. And, you know, I was in my 50s when this, when this happened. So it was so satisfying. I just, I really can't fully describe. That's why I tell people in the book, I say, definitely connect to your call. Find out. Don't don't die and not find out what those people group connections are because everyone that doesn't find out is really missing something. It's a part of it, like the full moon. You know, you got the great culture that you know, but hey, here's this other half. Let's find out what's on the other half. So now I don't I don't just say I'm an African American because I know I'm an American Ghanaian Nigerian just like every other American I'm able to say exactly what I am. So I'm not just called by a continent anymore because I have demystified the uh, DNA connections in my blood, and I have changing my name was really to me kind of nullifying the legacy of enslavement. Because my ancestors didn't have English name when they got taken from Africa. So I have gone back to African names. But I kept Richard because so many people knew me as Rick. And it was just easier for them because Rick is short for Richard. And then also my mother, you know, she just refuses. You know, she won't even call me Ezzy. Because even Ezzy is easy, but she just refuses. She's just, I'm going to call you Rick. That's what I'm going to call you, Okay. So I was like, okay, my mom's 84 years old. What are you going to say? What are you going to say? Right? So I'm like, okay, mom. I said, as he is. And then, then the thing is, she even projects it onto her friends at church, right? And then I'll try to tell her friends, as you know, because she said, oh, that's Rick, y'all. That's Rick. I was like, mom, just, mom, let me introduce myself. <laughs> okay. So anyway. Well, and I was, I was, before you just said that, I was just going to ask, you know, what was the kind of response to your fa from your family when you started on learning more about your culture and, and doing the DNA test and changing your name? Well, now mom will still call me Rick, but uh, the other aspect she really likes. So I'm going to give you this example. My sister was very resistant. Uh, so one day I brought home some igusi soup with pounded yam, which is a which is a very popular soup in Nigeria. Uh, Egusi soup, just, just imagine how chili is in America, that you can have chili at all these different places, and, and they make it a little different, but it's still chili, right? Egusi soup is kind of like that in Nigeria. 
you know, if you're closer to the coast, you might have fresh fish, that fresh fish in it. Uh, if you're inland, you might have dried fish or stockfish, or you might have beef. You might have, and then they also use, which we don't use a lot, they use um, cow skin, thick cow skin, and they call it pomo. Pomo is the name of it. Uh, and it's like a, a staple thing that they cook with just, they'll have meat and that in there, you know. Um, I think we call it, it, the most similar thing we have is called fat back, I guess, in um, in the U.S. But uh, it's not actually like that. It's just basically the skin. It doesn't have the fat. It's just the skin, the, the, cow, the thick cow skin. Kind of like, imagine pork rinds before they're cooked, okay? Pork rinds before they're cooked, but they cook them in the soup, okay? So at any rate, you know, so uh, I bought this agusi soup with the pounded yam. And I, said, I told him, I said, hey, my mother, my niece, my daughter, my, my sister's daughter was there, as well as my sister. And I said, hey, I bought some goosey soup home for you all to try. And my sister, oh, I don't want any. I don't want any. I don't want some. Okay, no problem. It's not going to go to waste, you know. And so she, uh, my mother said, okay, well, let me try it. So my mother tried it. She said, oh, that's delicious, right? And then my niece tried it. And she said, oh, that is good, right? Well. Guess who wanted to try some now? Yes. Yes, my reluctant sister. She wanted to try some now. Okay. So she tried it like, you know how you try something like, like almost like you're getting medicine, get to, you, you, you frown on your face and everything like that. She had her little frown and everything. And then she tasted it and it tasted good. She was like, oh, that is good. Now she found out that there is uh, somebody working uh, with her that knew me because I joined the local Nigerian community. So she found out somebody working and she asked them, she said, the next time you make a goosey soup, could you please bring me some? And I just got a text message from her yesterday that she said her friend, our friend bought her some goosey soup with fufu, which is a different kind of thing that you eat it with. It's made of plantain and cassava. And so she said, it was so delicious. I said, and see, that is what I'm talking about. She reluctantly connected to the culture, but now she's really happy about it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now you've mentioned a couple times the book that you've written. So do you want to share a little bit more about that, the title and kind of what you've put into it? Yes, actually, um, so many people were telling my story. Like when I would meet people, uh, they would say, I already know who you are because other people had told them about me. And so people were saying, you need to tell the story because it is really unique that you as an African-American connected to your roots, you've legally changed your name. They said, it's just so unusual. It's such a great story, right? And so I wrote the book, Found My People. I used to kick myself because I was, it took, you know, 2013, I said I was going to do it. So I only, it took five years before I stopped really nagging myself about why haven't you done it yet? Why haven't you done it? Because I was working on it, but you know, life, you got bills, you got, you know, all of these things that you have to do, right? And so that kind of finds its way where it can find it. Well, when I took my daughter to college, we went to a, we went to a Caribbean restaurant. And this incident that is in the book is what made me say I wasn't supposed to write the book because this needs to be in the book. So I went in and I told the young lady, it was, it said it was Caribbean. I said, well, what, what, uh, Caribbean, uh, nation is this, you know, kind of food are you selling here? She said, Jamaican. I said, okay. I said, well, I'm an American Nigerian. I told her and she said, okay. So she took my order. She took my daughter's order. And then she looked at me and she said, you say you're an American Nigerian. I said, yeah. She said, well, were you born in Nigeria? I said, no. She said, well, were, you, were your parents born in Nigeria? I said, no. She said, then you're not Nigerian. And so I looked her straight in the eye and I said, here's the thing. When you know who you are, it doesn't matter what anybody else says. I said, but what are you? And she said, with each each exclamation, her fist was going in the air. She said, I'm Jamaican, man. I'm Jamaican, man. I am Jamaican, with her fist held high in the air at the last one. I said, oh, okay. I said, you're Jamaican. She said, yes. I said, so you know Jamaican culture? She said, yes. I said, and you know Jamaican food and everything? She said, yes. I said, Jamaica is a country, but what people group? What's the name of the people group, the tribe that you're connected to? Could have heard a pin drop. I said, because 
You'll see when you do your DNA tests, it will tell you what people group you're connected to, what tribe. I said, I am Nigerian Igbo in Yoruba and of the Fanti people of Ghana. So I know what people groups I'm connected to. I said, so what group are you connected to? And when I told her that, her mother said, he is correct. It's not going to say Jamaica. It's going to tell you what African people you're connected to. And so then she was humble enough to say, well, I guess between the two of us, I don't really know who I am. And so I told her, I said, but you can find out. So I told her how she could find out, how she could do her DNA and everything like that. But and that also answers that question you asked me earlier. How has it changed my life? It's given me such a confidence to really know the other side of the moon in that analogy. Uh, just like when somebody, she could tell me, you know, she wasn't the first person that told me you're not Nigerian because just because I wasn't born, I said, I am not going to let the fact that greedy people in the past uh, took my ancestors from Africa and greedy people sold my ancestors on the other side. And that that is going to make me say what I'm not. No, I said to her, the blood doesn't lie. I said, the blood doesn't lie. When you do your DNA and it tells you who you are, that is who you are. Whether you were connected to that or not, that is who you are. Now, you have a choice when you find out. You can let it be coffee table, cooler, talk, be anecdotal in your life. And you know you have every right to do that if that's what you want to do. But for me, it was transformational. It enriched my life in ways that I never imagined it would. Yes, and it is fascinating to hear that story, to think about you know, as you mentioned, the various names of African Americans that like, by saying you're Nigerian, you're specifying what part of Africa that like, in yeah, there are 54 <laughs> countries in Africa, yeah. you know, yeah, to, to me, that like parallel, like, it just isn't connecting because, you know, it's, and to be honest, it's not something I've necessarily thought about as the like, I'm well aware that Africa is a continent, mm -hmm. there are countries in Africa, but how right. we have these different specifications for other continents when you're talking about what kind of American are you? Right. Well, this is the thing, and that part of what I'm doing when I'm talking about the book is also letting people know, for example, African Americans are the only group of people that called are called by a continent, and now it's about to change to BIPOC, right? Uh, they're the only people that have a name, but most of us have never tried the food. I had, you know, I have a story in the book when I was in seventh grade, we had to do a cultural dish and I brought tacos because I had no idea what African food was. I didn't know anything about a goosey soup or pounded yam. Okay. Um, so the, the good thing about what I'm doing is, is letting people who are African American know to connect to their roots, but it's letting the other Americans know because sometimes they don't realize the damage that was done to the descendants of the enslaved. I hear too many times people say, oh, I didn't enslave anybody. Why, why, why should I care about that? Well, the only Americans that are called African, you know, Italian Americans know Italian food. India, people, Indian Americans from India, they know Indian food. You know, Spanish Americans know Spanish food. Chinese Americans know Chinese food. German Americans know German food. You know, uh, Greek Americans know Greek food. There's no American that has a name that aren't familiar intimately with the food and culture of that name, except African Americans. And when you look at the fact that 47 million in the U.S., and then when you count, there's 90 million in Brazil, and when you count the other areas that brings another 70 million to 200 million, you have a tragedy that is as bad as the Holocaust, but for many more people over a much longer time. Now, some people try to say, oh, that's worse because there's more people. I said, well, it's not the same. So I don't compare them like that. They're both bad. We all agree that the Holocaust was bad. Shouldn't have happened, right? We all agree on that. This also was just as bad because you have people that have been completely disconnected from their culture, right? And then now we've got over 200 million, and that's just on this side of the earth. That's not counting Europe and the Middle East. I don't know how many it is when you, when you count those numbers. Just on this side, it's over 200 million. And the answer can't be, well, you just need to forget about that and move on. 
you know, only thing that matters is that you know Jesus. That's what I've heard. So many, I mean, I'm even from from all different color people. That's all I've heard. You know, doesn't matter. You know, you know, you just know all you need to do is know that. Yes, I do know Jesus and I am glad I do. But why should everybody else that knows Jesus know also where they're from except for us? I reject people like that out of hand. That's like, oh, no, you can't. It's arrogant of them to tell me that when they have theirs. You know, Uh, there's a book, uh, excuse me, a chapter in the book called Dissension in the Ranks, where a real Yoruba princess. I mean, her father is a king, Oba, king. Oba means king in Yoruba. She is literally a princess. Okay, she is upset with African-Americans because we want to find out about our roots. That upsets her. I said, well, if that upsets you, then you are at odds with God himself, because God in the Bible tells us from Abraham to Jesus is 42 generations, 14 generations from Abraham to uh, David, from 14 from David to the carrying way of Israel and 14 from carrying way of Israel to Jesus. I said, and that's some of the most boring reading in the Bible. Begot such and such, begot such and such, such and such, begot such and such, you know. I've told the Lord this, you know, he, I'm not telling him nothing he don't already know, but he put it there because it's important for them, for us to know. It's important for us to know. That's why he put it there. So I told her, I said, you, me, me and God, we agree. I said, you don't agree with us. I said, that's all right. I'd rather be with God than you. I said, so don't worry. We don't have to be talking. You, bye-bye. I'm going to go ahead and connect to my roots, okay? I just don't let people like that tell me what I'm going to do. Yes. And it has seemed very much like connecting with your roots has really basically just opened up an entire world for you. Revolutionary. I do want to take a little bit of a pivot. Um, I mentioned it briefly in the intro about a life-threatening illness. So would you mind sharing kind of about that part of your life? Okay. I just remembered you asked me to tell people how they could get in touch with me. I never told them that. Okay. So, uh, foundmypeople.com mm-hmm. is the website. It's also the name of the book. Mm-hmm. Very easy. Found my people. And for those people that get the book, get in touch because there's a fact sheet because the cover of the found my people book is rich with culture. It is rich with culture. And, uh, so I have something to decode that, that I will send to the people that buy the book. So now, You said the life-threatening illness. Yes. When I was on my way back uh, in 2019, because I had actually wanted to go back, but it wasn't until 2019 that I was able to get back. So the first time I go back, you know, you have to take travel injections. It was like four different travel injections. Well, something about those travel injections disagreed with me because when you do your blood work on your physical, your creatine, is the one that tells you what's going on with your kidneys. So in January of 2019, my creatine was 1.21, which is normal because it's supposed to be 1.4 or less. Well, something about those injections damaged my kidneys and my liver, and my numbers were way out of whack. My creatine got up to 4.94, which is chronic kidney disease stage four. And medical science says, and my doctor told me when she gave me the diagnosis, she said, you're going to have to be on dialysis for the rest of your life. She said, and you might even have liver failure. And to top it off, they gave me a side order of sepsis, you know, just so my meal would be complete. You know what I mean? (laughs) Yes. Possible kidney failure, possible liver failure, and a side order of sepsis just so, you know, you know where you're at, right? Anyway, um, I had received a prophetic word three years earlier to the month, June of 2016, where the Lord said that he was going to strengthen my body in the natural and supernatural. And then in 2017, he allowed me to see the video, What the Health, Forks Over Knives and Food Incorporated. Have you seen those? Mm -mm. Oh, you need to write those down. What the Health? Food Incorporated and Forks Over Knives, it opened up what really is going on with the the food in the U.S., okay? So after I saw that, I started eating organic. I started going much more organic. There's a lot of stuff I used to eat. I cut out restaurants. I started drinking green tea and lemon juice because that is high alkaline and, 
You know, I found out things like cancer, like acidic body and alkaline body. Cancer finds it hard to grow an uh, alkaline body. OK, so I wanted to make sure that I was high alkaline. So I'm I don't when I go out to restaurants, I, I bring my green tea and lemon juice. I don't they, the way that I make mine. There's nothing that they have in the restaurant that tastes as good as what I have. So I bring mine with me. Right. Uh, but I kept my body high alkaline. My cutting board got all kind of use it never got before. I mean, you know, when you eat healthy, you're cutting, you use cutting board all the time, right? For vegetables, for fruit. And so I just changed to a, a healthy lifestyle. I lost like 70 pounds. Um, so anyway, so this all happened before this, you know, trip on 2019. So I listened to the diagnosis from the doctor. You're going to have to have dialysis for the rest of your life. You possible liver failure. You have sepsis. So, you know, that's something that actually can kill people. So we've got to monitor and try to, you know, get rid of that. So it was like one thing after the other, right? And she said, well, I said, well, how can this, you know, I asked her, I said, well, how can I, you know, reverse this, get back? Because I said, just in six months ago, I had 1.21 January, right? She said, well, uh, unfortunately, this does not, is not, Reverse. She said it's impossible. In medical science, in medical science says whatever you get to on that creatine, it cannot reverse. If, if you do the right things lifestyle wise, it can maintain, but they said it can't reverse. So after she told me that, I looked at her and I said, that's not going to happen. I said, I'm going to make a miraculous recovery. She said, why do you say that? I said, because God has made promises to me and that I can't do the things he said I was going to do. He told me to get ready to travel. He told me the things that he has for me to say is not just for my town and not just for my state that I, he would be sending me out internationally. And so I said, I am, I, I am going to make a miraculous recovery because God does not lie. He don't tell you something and then it's not going to happen. I said, he knew when he said that, that this day was going to happen because the things he told me haven't happened yet. Right. And so she said, she said, OK, well, when I left in five days, I said, in five days, I'm going to walk out of here. My creatinine is going to be back to one point two one and make a miraculous recovery. In five days, I did walk out of there. And the doctor even said it was remarkable because I have still have the medical record. She said, patient made him a remarkable recovery. But but my creatinine was not down to 1.21 yet. It, it went from 4.94 to 3.4. But she told me the fact that it went down by 1.5 in five days, she said that is remarkable. You know, doctors don't want to say miraculous. They just they don't want to say miraculous. But I said miraculous because although I was disappointed because I was expecting, fully believing that it was going to be 1.21. So it took three years before it got back to normal. And uh, so, you know, people ask me, why you think? I said, I don't know. I don't know why the Lord took three years. I don't know. But I didn't just go home, eat, you know, burgers and chips and soda and, and expect the Lord to heal me. Right. I was eating all organic. I was doing my high alkaline thing, you know, walking, getting, you know, my exercise, a lot of walking, things like that. I was doing everything I could to help my body. My doctor told me that if I had not changed my eating habits and lost the weight and strengthened my body, he said, this would have killed you. In other words, if, if before I got the prophetic word, before I made all the changes, if the way I was then, because I look actually younger now than I did 15 years ago. People very regularly mistake me for somebody that is like early 40s. You know, when they look at me, they're like, oh, you know, when I tell them my real age, Sometimes I have to really pull out my my um, my, my driver's license because they don't believe me, right? They think I'm they think I'm kidding with them. They said you are you are kidding with me. No, you. I showed my driver's license. They were like, "Wow, you know, wow." I was like, and then we I went to a forty year high school reunion, and some of the people that went to school with me, they said, "Damn, you look like you did when you were in high school. How did you do that?" I said. It's just the Lord. I to give the Lord the credit. I, you know, I can't take the credit. But um, yeah, so what I did was I definitely did everything in my power to help my body. I did high alkaline. I, you know, hydrated well. I put the, the uh, you know, the Himalayan sea salt. The Himalayan sea salt has like 83, 83 
um, minerals. Did you know that? You put that Himalayan sea salt in your water and with the lemon juice, that alkaline water, and you get those minerals, that actually hydrates your body better than just water. If you just drink water and you don't have those minerals, it doesn't hydrate your body well. So I made my body high alkaline, organic, you know, just the, the, the foods that I cook is much better than what I get at a restaurant. I mean, I, by the grace of God, I can really cook, you know. My mother taught us how to cook, so um, I got some skills, you know, got a, got a few skills. And um, so I enjoy my cooking. And um, so anyway, it, it was that that I did, and I believed that I would be healed. And medical science does not have an answer for how this happened when they said it's impossible. And I went from 4.94 back to being healed. I've never had that, nor will I ever have dialysis a day in my life. So how can you know that? God told me. He, and then, you know, there's there's a scripture that says, Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. I often recite that, that I say that I am prosperous and in health because God doesn't promise you something and lie. He, he What he tells you, he will do. And if you believe it, it will happen for you. He doesn't say how long it will take. That's where people get tripped up. Got that. What I call, I call that the um, their faith has an expiration date. That's that expiration date faith. You know, if their faith is really good until it gets to that date, then it drops off a cliff. It's like uh, if you if you know, I'm a financial person. So if you know uh, cliff vesting, like your 401k, they call it cliff vesting. You know, 20 percent this year, 20 percent that year. Then then if you leave, you get 100 percent. That's called a cliff because it's off the cliff. You get 100 percent then. Well, some people have cliff faith. It goes this way, this way, this way. It doesn't happen by this way. They don't believe the God anymore. He didn't do it when they said he should, so they don't believe him anymore. That's not the way to do it. Well, remarkable or miraculous. I appreciate that you shared that story here. I'm glad, you know, that things got significantly better. Now, before I start to wrap things up, is there anything else you would like to share with the listeners today? Well... Another thing God gave me was the poem that is the same title as the book. It's called Found My People. I found my people. You can too. There's a people for me and a people for you. Like a door that you found in your house that is new. With elaborate furnishings all belonging to you. A people who will welcome and make you feel new. I've found the people for me. Now find the people for you. Awesome. I appreciate you sharing that poem. And I think, you know, reading more in your book can be very enlightening. So I will definitely make sure to leave that and everything else good in the description here. Now, at the end of all my episodes, I do ask my guests a random question that doesn't have to do with what we've been talking about. My question okay. for you today is what instrument has the funniest sound? Oh, I thought you were going to do the Jeopardy music first. Like, do, 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 <laughs> do, do, um, What instrument has the funniest sound? Well, do you mean funny like laugh funny or funny like peculiar or melodious like you un didn't expect it? You could answer either. You could answer both, whatever okay. whatever you feel. I've got one that has a nice sound that I don't think most people expect. And most people, when they hear it, they might not even know that's what it is. It's called the kalimba. Do you know what the kalimba is? I do not. The kalimba. Oh, we're going to send people to, we're going to send people to Duck, Duck, Go. I tell them to go to Duck, Duck, Go because Duck, Duck, Go does not search you all or follow you all over the internet like some of the other ones, which we won't name with the big G. We won't name who they are, you know, but um, DuckDuckGo doesn't do that. So I use DuckDuckGo search. Now, I am not a paid spokesperson for DuckDuckGo, just in case you all are wondering. OK, I just like privacy. But um, so look up Kalimba, go to images, look up Kalimba. It's an African thumb piano. Beautiful sound comes from the Kalimba. If you've heard. Back in the day, Earth, Wind, and Fire, a lot of their music, they'll have that the beautiful, melodious kalimba as part of their music. So, yeah, or you can look up kalimba music on YouTube, and I'm sure you'll be able to find all kinds of videos because I haven't. There's literally nothing that I've looked up that I haven't been able to find on YouTube. YouTube's got, like, <laughs> everything, just about anything, you know, 
people that like to paint their toes pink, there's probably a video, right? <laughs> All right, that brings this episode to a close. So if you would like to connect with Ezzy, you are welcome to check out his Instagram or his website. Both of those links will be in the description. So feel free to connect with him, check out his book. And of course, if you would like to connect with the podcast, our website is in the description as well. It brings you to all of our social media. We are on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. So feel free to go follow those pages. And if you would like to support the podcast monetarily, there's a link to do that as well. And if you would like to share your story about your life, your culture, whatever it may be, to be a guest on this show, my email is in the description is always the best way to reach me. So thank you so much, Ezzy, for spending time with me today and to my listeners for taking the time out of your day to hear a new story. Until next time, bye. Thank you and thank the listeners as well. <laughs>